1. Private Law Without question, the legal system is the one facet of society that supposedly requires state provision. Even such champions of laissez-faire as Milton Friedman and Ludwig von Mises believed a government must exist to protect private property and define the rules of the game. However, their arguments focused on the necessity of law itself. They simply assumed that the market is incapable of defining and protecting property rights. They were wrong. In this essay, I argue that the elimination of the state will not lead to lawless chaos. Voluntary institutions will emerge to effectively and peacefully resolve the disputes arising in everyday life. Not only will market law be more efficient, it will also be more equitable than the government alternative. Just as right-wing hacks embrace the Orwellian notion that war is peace, left-wing egalitarians believe that slavery is freedom. The hawks wage endless war to end war, while the social democrats engaged in massive theft, or taxation as they call it, to eliminate crime. It is high time to abandon such monstrous paradoxes. It took no king to produce language, money or science, and it takes no government to produce a just legal system. 1. Contract First, we must abandon the idea of a mythical law of the land. There doesn't need to be a single set of laws binding everyone. In any event, such a system never existed. The laws in each of the fifty states are different, and the difference in legal systems between countries is even more pronounced. Yet we go about our daily lives and even visit and do business with foreign nations without too much trouble. All actions in a purely free society would be subject to contract. For example, it is currently a crime to steal because the legislature says so. A prospective employer knows that if I steal from his firm, he can notify the government and it will punish me. But in a stateless society there wouldn't be a legislated body of laws, nor would there be government courts or police. Nonetheless, employers would still like some protection from theft by their employees. So, before hiring an applicant, the employer would make him sign a document that had clauses to the effect of, I promise not to steal from the Acme firm. If I get caught stealing, as established by Arbitration Agency X, then I agree to pay whatever restitution that Agency X deems appropriate. We immediately see two things in this contract. First, It is completely voluntary. Any laws binding the employee have been acknowledged by him beforehand. Second, the existence of arbitration agency X ensures fairness and objectivity in any disputes. To see this, suppose that it didn't. Suppose that a big firm bribed the arbitrators at agency X so that lazy workers, who were going to be fired anyway, were, falsely, charged by the employers with embezzlement, while Agency X always ruled guilty. With this scheme, the big firm could bilk thousands of dollars from its bad employees before terminating them, and since the hapless employees had agreed beforehand to abide by the arbitration outcome, they could do nothing about it. But, upon consideration, it's easy to see that such behaviour would be foolish. Just because an arbitration agency ruled a certain way wouldn't make everyone agree with it, just as people complain about outrageous court rulings by government judges. The press would pick up on the unfair rulings, and people would lose faith in the objectivity of Agency X's decisions. Potential employees would think twice before working for the big firm, as long as it required in its work contracts that people submitted to the suspect Agency X. Other firms would patronise different, more reputable arbitration agencies, and workers would flock to them. Soon enough, the corrupt big firm and arbitration agency X would suffer huge financial penalties for their behaviour. Under market anarchy, all aspects of social intercourse would be regulated by voluntary contracts. Specialised firms would probably provide standardised forms so that new contracts wouldn't have to be drawn up every time people did business. For example, if a customer bought something on instalment, the store would probably have him sign a form that said something to the effect, 
I agree to the provisions of the 2002 edition standard deferred payment procedures as published by the ACE legal firm. Expertise Under this system, legal experts would draft the laws of the land, not corrupt and inept politicians, and these experts would be chosen in open competition with all rivals. Right now one can buy definitive style manuals for writing term papers or dictionaries of the English language. The government doesn't need to establish the experts in these fields. It would be the same way with private legal contracts. Everybody knows the rules of grammar, just like everybody would know what's legal and what isn't. Murder of course, one of the most basic stipulations in any contractual relationship, whether entering a mall or living in a neighbourhood co-op, would be strong prohibitions on murder. In other words, all contracts of this type would have a clause saying, if I am found guilty of murder, I agree to pay Y million dollars to the estate of the deceased. Naturally, no one would sign such a contract unless he were sure that the trial procedures used to determine his guilt or innocence had a strong presumption of innocence. Nobody would want to be found guilty of a murder he didn't commit. But on the other hand, the procedures would have to be designed so that there was still a good chance that guilty people would actually be convicted, since people don't want to shop in malls where murder goes unpunished. And, because all contracts of this sort, except possibly in very eccentric areas frequented by people who liked to live dangerously, would contain such clauses, one could say that murder is illegal in the whole anarchist society, even though the evidentiary rules and penalties might differ from area to area. But this is no different from our current system, and no one doubts that murder is illegal in the current United States. Profitability the standard. The beauty of this system is that the competing desires of everyone are taken into account. The market solves this problem every day in reference to other goods and services. For example, it would be very convenient for customers if a deli were open 24 hours a day, but on the other hand such long shifts would be very tedious for its workers. So the market system of profit and loss determines the correct hours of operation. In the same way, we saw above how evidentiary rules would be determined under a system of private law. Because people would be submitting themselves contractually to the rulings of a certain arbitration agency, the agency would need a reputation for objectivity and fairness to defendants. But on the other hand, the owners of stores, firms, rental cars, etc., would want some means of restitution in the event of theft, and so the arbitration agencies couldn't be too lenient. As with the hours of a store's operation, so too would the legal procedures be decided by the profit and loss test. Maybe there would be juries, maybe there wouldn't. We can't predict this beforehand, just as we can't say a priori how many tricycles should be made this year. We let the market take care of it automatically. 2. Insurance the contractual system described above seems to work well except for one nagging problem. How can people afford to pay these outrageous fines? Granted, someone might sign a piece of paper pledging restitution to his employer if he is caught stealing. But suppose he steals anyway and is found guilty by the arbitration agency but has no money. Then what? Well, how does our present system of auto damages work? Right now, if I sideswipe someone, I must pay a stiff penalty, or rather, my insurance company does. It would be the same way with all torts and crimes under the system I've described. An insurance company would act as a guarantor or co-signer of a client's contracts with various firms, just as a bank uses experts to take depositors' money and efficiently allocate it to borrowers, so too would the experts at the insurance company determine the risk of a certain client, i.e. the likelihood he or she would violate contracts by stealing or killing, and charge an appropriate premium. Thus, other firms wouldn't have to keep tabs on all of their customers and employees. The firm's only responsibility would be to make sure everyone they dealt with carried a policy with a reputable insurance agency. Under this system, the victims of a crime are always paid, immediately. 
Contrast this to the government system where victims usually get nothing except the satisfaction of seeing the criminal placed behind bars. There would also be incentives for people to behave responsibly. Just as reckless drivers pay higher premiums for car insurance, so too would repeat offenders be charged higher premiums for their contract insurance. First, keep in mind that wherever someone is standing in a purely libertarian society, he would be on somebody's property. This is the way in which force could be brought to bear on criminals without violating their natural rights. For example, the contract of a movie theatre would have a clause to the effect, If I am judged guilty of a crime by a reputable arbitration agency, perhaps listed in an appendix, I release the theatre owner from any liability should armed men come to remove me from his property. So we see that it is not a contradiction to use force to capture fugitives in a completely voluntary society. All such uses would have been authorised by the recipients themselves beforehand. But where would these ne'er-do-wells be taken once they were brought into custody? Specialised firms would develop offering high-security analogues to the current jailhouse. However, the jails in market anarchy would compete with each other to attract criminals. Consider, no insurance company would vouch for a serial killer if he applied for a job at the local library, but they would deal with him if he agreed to live in a secure building under close scrutiny. The insurance company would make sure that the jail that held him was well run, After all, if the person escaped and killed again, the insurance company would be held liable since it pledges to make good on any damages its clients commit. On the other hand, there would be no undue cruelty for the prisoners in such a system. Although they would have no chance of escape, unlike government prisons, they wouldn't be beaten by sadistic guards. If they were, they'd simply switch to a different jail, just as travellers can switch hotels if they view the staff as discourteous. Again, the insurance company which vouches for a violent person doesn't care which jail its client chooses, so long as its inspectors have determined that the jail will not let its client escape into the general population. 4. Doubts Although superficially coherent and workable, the proposed system of market law will certainly engender scepticism. In the interest of brevity, I will deal with some common and valid concerns. What about someone who has no insurance? If an individual didn't carry insurance, other people would have no guaranteed recourse should the individual damage or steal their property. Such an individual would therefore be viewed with suspicion, and people would be reluctant to deal with them except for single transactions involving small sums. He would probably be unable to get a full-time job, a bank loan or a credit card. Many residential and commercial areas would probably require that all visitors carried valid policies before allowing them to even enter. So we see that those without insurance would have their options, including their freedom of movement, greatly restricted. At the same time, the premiums for basic contract insurance, at least for people without a criminal history, would be quite low so there wouldn't be very many people walking around without this type of insurance. It's true, some people would still commit crimes and would have no insurance company to pay damages, but such cases are going to occur under any legal system. Furthermore, once someone without insurance had committed a serious crime, he would still be chased by detectives just as he would be under the government system. And if these, far more efficient, private detectives found him at any time on a normal piece of property, they would have the full right to arrest him. Warring Agencies Critics often dismiss private law by alleging that disputes between enforcement agencies would lead to combat, even though this happens between governments all the time. In truth, the incentives for peaceful resolution of disputes would be far greater in market anarchy than the present system. Combat is very expensive, and private companies take much better care of their assets than government officials take of their subjects' lives and property. In any event, those engaging in warfare in a free society would be treated as any other murderers, 
Unlike government soldiers, private mercenaries would receive no special privileges to engage in condoned violence. Those agencies interpreting the law would not be the same as the firms enforcing it. There is no intrinsic reason to worry about battles between private enforcement agencies any more than battles between the government, army and navy. Won't the Mafia take over? It is paradoxical that the fear of rule by organised crime families causes people to support the state, which is the most organised and criminal association in human history. Even if it were true that under market anarchy people had to pay protection money and occasionally get whacked, this would be a drop in the bucket compared to the taxation and wartime deaths caused by governments. But even this concedes too much, for the mob derives its strength from government, not the free market. All of the businesses traditionally associated with organised crime, gambling, prostitution, loan sharking, drug dealing, are prohibited or heavily regulated by the state. In market anarchy, true professionals would drive out such unscrupulous competitors. Your insurance companies would become the state. On the contrary, the private companies providing legal services would have far less power under market anarchy than the government currently possesses. Most obvious, there would be no power to tax or to monopolise service. If a particular insurance company were reluctant to pay legitimate claims, this would quickly become known and people would take this into account when dealing with clients of this disreputable firm. The fear that, under market anarchy, private individuals would replace politicians overlooks the true causes of state mischief. Unlike feudal monarchs, democratic rulers don't actually own the resources, including human, that they control. Furthermore, the duration of their rule, and hence control of these resources, is very uncertain. For these reasons, politicians and other government employees do not exercise much care in maintaining the market value of the property in their jurisdiction. Shareholders of a private company, however, have every interest in choosing personnel and policies to maximise the profitability of the firm. All the horrors of the state, onerous taxation, police brutality, total war, are not only monstrous, but they are also grossly inefficient. It would never be profitable for anarchist insurance and legal firms to mimic the policies set by governments. Children The question of children is one of the most difficult. As a first pass, let us note that, obviously, concerned parents would only patronise those schools and live in those apartments or housing complexes where the protection of their children was of paramount importance to the staff. Beyond this, the basic prohibitions on parental child abuse and neglect could be stipulated in the marriage contract. In addition to whatever romance may be entailed, our marriage is ultimately a partnership between two people, and prudent couples will officially spell out this arrangement with all of its benefits and obligations. For example, before abandoning her career to raise a man's children, a woman may require a financial pledge in the case of divorce, i.e. dissolving the partnership. In the same way, a standard clause in marriage contracts could define and specify penalties for the improper treatment of children. Another point to consider is the enhanced role of adoption in a free society. Much as it shocks modern sensibilities, there would be a fully functioning baby market in which parental privileges were sold to the highest bidder. Although seemingly crass, such a market would surely reduce child abuse. After all, abusive or negligent parents are probably the ones most likely to offer their children for adoption when loving couples are allowed to pay them handsomely for it. The controversial issue of abortion, just as other conflicts in a private law system, would be handled by competing firms setting policies to best match the desires of their customers. Those people sufficiently horrified by the practice could establish a gated community in which all residents agreed to refrain from abortion and to report anyone caught performing one. Title Registry In market anarchy, who would define property rights? If someone hands over the money to purchase a house, what guarantees does he have? This is a complex issue, 
and I won't be able to give specifics since the actual market solution would depend on the circumstances of the case and would draw on the legal expertise, far greater than mine, of the entire community. I can, however, offer some general remarks. Whatever, if any, the abstract or metaphysical nature of property law, the purpose of public titles is quite utilitarian. They are necessary to allow individuals to effectively plan and coordinate their interactions with each other. Specialised firms, perhaps distinct from arbitration agencies, would keep records on the property titles, either for a specific area or group of individuals. Title registry would probably be accomplished through a complex hierarchical web of such firms. The fear of rogue agencies unilaterally declaring themselves owner of everything is completely unfounded. In market anarchy, the companies publicizing property rights would not be the same as the companies enforcing those rights. More important, competition between firms would provide true checks and balances. If one firm began flouting the community norms established and codified on the market, it would go out of business, just as surely as a manufacturer of dictionaries would go broke if its books contained improper definitions. Infinite Regress A sophisticated critic may charge that my proposal rests upon a circular argument. How can people use contracts to define property rights when a system of property rights is necessary to determine which contracts are valid? After all, Smith can't sell Jones a car for a certain sum of money unless it is established beforehand that Smith is the just owner of the car and Jones the owner of the sum of money. To see the solution, we must break the problem into two parts. First, we should ask... Could the free market provide a foundation for social interaction? I believe the previous sections have demonstrated this. That is, I have shown above that if we had a system of property titles recognized by competing firms, then a contractual system governing the exchange of those titles would form a stable basis for private law. Now, it is an entirely different question to ask, how are these titles initially defined and allocated? This is a broad topic and will be addressed in the next section, but to deal with the issue as it relates to the alleged infinite regress, let us consider contract law. Contract law is a specific branch of law, much as tort law or constitutional law. It is used, for example, to determine whether a contract between two parties is legally binding. Now, surely contract law can't be established in an anarchist system of contractual law, for wouldn't this beg the question? No. The contractual pledges made by individuals would contain provisions for all of the contingencies handled by today's contract law. For example, the insurance company backing up a customer would be promising, We will make good on any debts that our client fails to pay, so long as the obligations have been spelled out in a valid contract according to the terms described in the standard contract law pamphlet published by the ACE legal firm. This pamphlet would perhaps require signatures in black ink, notarized oversight for large sums, and the signers to a contract were of sufficient age and sobriety and were not under duress when the contract was made. As with all elements of private law, the precise rules governing contract interpretation would be determined by the possibly conflicting desires of everyone through the profit and loss test. Finally, keep in mind that the ultimate judge in a given case is the judge. No matter how voluminous the law books or how obvious the precedents, every case will ultimately depend on the subjective interpretation of an arbiter or judge who must deliver the ruling. We must never forget that written statutes as such are powerless unless used by competent and equitable individuals. Only in a competitive, voluntary system is there any hope for judicial excellence. How do we get there? The route to a free society will vary according to the history of a region and consequently no single description will do. The path taken by North Korean market anarchists will no doubt differ from the course of similarly minded individuals in the United States. In the former, violent overthrow of unjust regimes may occur, 
while in the latter a gradual and orderly erosion of the state is a wonderful possibility. The one thing all such revolutions would share is a commitment by the overwhelming majority to a total respect of property rights. All societies, no matter how despotic their rulers, must possess a basic degree of respect for property rights, even if such respect is given due to custom rather than intellectual appreciation. All people know that it is a crime to rape or murder. Even rapists and murderers know this. Such universal intuitive notions of justice would constitute the foundation for a system of private law. This widespread agreement would allow for more specific, contractually defined rights to evolve. The process would be continuous, with one stage of codified property titles and legal rules forming the basis for the next generation of judges and scholars to systematize and extend. Regular people understand the waste and senselessness of conflict. They will go to great lengths and make great compromises to achieve consensus. For example, despite the lack of a formal government, newly arriving miners during the California gold rushes respected the claims of earlier settlers. To take a more modern example, even inner-city toughs unthinkingly obey the rules in a pick-up game of basketball, despite the lack of a referee. In market anarchy, free individuals through their patronage of competing judicial and insurance firms would foster a humane and just legal system. Those antisocial individuals who disrupted the process by blatantly violating obvious property rights would be dealt with in the ways described earlier. Legal Positivism some readers may wonder how I can propose a replacement for the state's justice system when I haven't first offered a rational theory of the source and nature of legitimate property rights. The answer is simple. I don't have such a theory. Nonetheless, I can still say that a market system of private law would work far more effectively than the state alternative and that the standard objections to anarchy are unfounded. There is widespread distrust of allowing the market to determine something as crucial as, say, prohibitions on murder. But the market is just shorthand for the totality of economic interactions of freely acting individuals. To allow the market to set legal rules really means that no one uses violence to impose his own vision on anyone else. Murder isn't wrong merely because it fails the market test, of course not. But its intrinsic immorality will find expression through market forces. We can all agree contractually to refrain from murder and to abide by the decisions made by an arbiter should we be tried for such a crime. In this way, we know we are not violating anyone's rights. Now, after we have reached such agreement and are secure in our lives, we can let the philosophers and theologians argue about why murder is wrong. Legal scholars offering a priori constructions of just law would certainly have a place in market anarchy. After all, their tracts might influence the judge's decisions. However, in this essay I focus on the market forces that will shape private law, not on the content of such law. 5. Applications So far I've concentrated on the critical issues in a theoretical discussion of private law. Now I would like to illustrate the versatility of such a system in a wide variety of areas and contrast its performance with the monopolized government alternative. Product Safety one of the most common charges against pure laissez-faire is that a completely unregulated market would leave consumers at the mercy of ruthless businessmen. We are told that without benevolent government oversight, food would be poisonous, television sets would explode and apartment buildings would collapse. It's true, such critics might concede, that in the long run shady companies would eventually go out of business but surely someone who sells a deadly hamburger should be immediately punished for this, on top of forfeiting future customers. As with other areas of law, I believe the market would deal with these sort of cases through contractual pledges. When a consumer bought something, 
Part of the package would be a guarantee such as, if this product causes injury as determined by a reputable arbitration agency, the customer is entitled to the standard damages. And, just as individuals would likely need to be backed by a large insurance company before anyone would do business with them, so too would businesses need to be insured against possible customer lawsuits if they wanted to attract customers. We immediately see that this system avoids the nightmare scenarios cooked up by proponents of government regulation. Let's take the case of air travel. The Federal Aviation Administration guarantees that airplanes have had proper maintenance, pilots are rested, etc. So customers don't need to worry about their planes crashing. In contrast, many people allege under a free market customers would have to keep statistics on how many crashes each airline had, and they'd have to be experts in airline maintenance to see which companies were best. But this is nonsense. All a flyer needs to do is make sure that when he buys a plane ticket, part of what he buys is a pledge, backed by an insurance company, saying, If you are killed in a plane crash, our airline will pay your estate Y million dollars. Now, since the insurance companies stand to lose millions if the planes of this airline crash, it is they who will hire trained inspectors, keep meticulous maintenance logs, etc., they would say to the airlines, yes, we will underwrite your contractual pledges to customers, but only if you follow our safety procedures, allow our inspectors to look at your planes, work out an adequate pilot screening process, etc., and if we catch you violating your agreement, we will fine you accordingly. Since they are out to maximise the profits, the insurance company will gladly pay for preventative efforts if this will lead to a greater savings in expected payments of claims to those killed in a crash. This stands in sharp contrast to the present system. The FAA, too, sets up guidelines, but what are its incentives? If there is a plane crash, the FAA itself will get more funding, since everyone will say the crash shows how awful the free market in aeroplanes is. Bloated government agencies always mismanage their resources so that there will be too many mid-leveled managers and not enough inspectors. Most important, since there is no competition, there is no benchmark against which to compare the FAA's oversight. Some lowly mechanic might have a great idea to improve airline safety, but the bureaucratic FAA would take years to implement it. Professional Licensing Closely related to the area of product safety is professional licensing. Let's use the example of medicine. Without government regulation, many believe patients would be at the mercy of quacks. Ignorant consumers would go to whatever brain surgeon charged the lowest price and would be butchered on the operating table. To prevent this, the benevolent government must establish guidelines, backed up by guns, to limit those who enter the medical profession. This, of course, is nonsense. Voluntary organisations would probably arise, allowing only qualified doctors into their ranks. Concerned consumers would then patronise only those doctors endorsed by re reputable associations. Before undergoing risky procedures or ingesting prescribed drugs, patients would require contractual pledges for restitution in the event of injury. In this case... It is again the insurance companies who would make sure the doctors they were underwriting were in fact qualified. Since they'd stand to lose millions in malpractice suits, the insurance companies would be very careful when setting their standards. Such a system would be far preferable to the present one. As it is, the American Medical Association is little more than a glorified union, which requires immense schooling and training to artificially restrict the number of doctors in order to drive up their salaries and health care costs in general. Without its monopoly, the AMA would be unable to check the growth in alternative therapies, such as herbal, that sidestep the current cosy alliance of big pharmaceutical companies, hospitals and the government, one must also realise that the incentives of the Food and Drug Administration render it far too conservative. If people die because of a new drug that the FDA has approved, the FDA will be blamed. But if people die because the FDA has not approved a new drug, it won't be held accountable. 
the sickness itself will be blamed. Consequently, many potentially life-saving drugs are currently being withheld from dying patients. In a purely free market, patients would be allowed to take whatever drugs they wanted. Gun Control I realize that many libertarians find certain aspects of my system a bit unnerving. Without unconditional guarantees of abstract rights, it seems there would always be a danger of smuggling the state in through the back door. Rather than dance around such issues, I'll give the best example I can think of to demonstrate the difference between the conventional libertarian approach and my own gun control. As we'll see, I don't think my approach is inconsistent with the libertarian creed, but I do think it will, at least initially, make many libertarians uncomfortable. The standard arguments over gun control go like this. Opponents say gun control will render people defenseless against criminals and leave citizens at the mercy of their government rulers. Only when someone has actually used his gun against innocence can the law rightfully step in. Proponents of gun control, however, argue that this position is too dogmatic. Surely some preventative measures are justified in the public interest. As with most debates held within the context of a government legal system, I think both sides have legitimate points. Certainly we cannot trust the government to protect us once it has disarmed us. But on the other hand, I feel a bit silly arguing people should be able to stockpile atomic weapons in their basement. A strict interpretation of many libertarian arguments would mean just that. Fortunately, the system of private law that I've described allows us to sidestep this apparent trade-off. Recall that the penalties for injury and murder would be established by contractual pledges underwritten by insurance companies. People allow Joe Smith onto their property because they know if he hurts someone, either he will directly pay the damages or his insurance company will. The insurance company makes its money by charging appropriate premiums, tailored to the individual client. If Joe Smith has been deemed guilty in the past of violent behaviour, his insurance premiums will be accordingly higher. But there are other factors that an insurance company would take into account when setting premiums besides past behaviour, and one of these factors would undoubtedly be what sort of weapons does this client keep around the house. After all, if the insurance company is going to agree to pay, say, $10 million to the estate of anyone Joe Smith kills, the company will be very interested to know whether Joe Smith keeps sawed-off shotguns let alone atomic weapons, in his basement. Someone who keeps such weapons is much more likely to harm others as far as the insurance agency is concerned, and so his premiums will be that much higher. In fact, the risk of a client who kept nuclear or chemical, biological, etc. weapons would be so great that probably no policy would be offered. This approach is superior to the government one. Truly dangerous weapons would be restricted to individuals willing to pay the high premiums associated with their ownership. Kids couldn't buy bazookas at the local Kmart. On the other hand, there wouldn't be a slippery slope that there is now with all government gun control. We would never fear that all handguns would be banned, since the insurance companies would be out strictly to make profit, and it would be far more profitable to allow people to keep handguns and pay slightly higher premiums. As with all contracts under my system, those regulating guns would be completely voluntary, involving no violation of libertarian rights. The insurance company is not forcing people to give up their bazookas. All it is saying is this, if you want us to guarantee your contracts with others, you can't own a bazooka. The insurance companies are the just owners of their money, and it is thus perfectly within their rights to make such a request. This is far preferable to the government system, which has no accountability. If politicians ban guns and cause thousands of people to be victimised by crime, nothing happens to them. But if, if an insurance company makes unreasonable demands of its clients, they will switch to a different company and it will quickly go out of business. Dangerous Criminals 
The supposed trade-off between individual liberty and public safety is also exemplified in the debates over legal technicalities. Conservatives like to complain about cases where a known murderer is set free by a bleeding-heart judge simply because the police coerced a confession or forgot to read the suspects his rights. Liberals, such as Alan Dershowitz, respond that although such cases are unfortunate, they are necessary to keep the police in line. As with gun control, I am sympathetic to both sides in this debate, and again, I think my system can avoid both sorts of absurdities. To see this, let's suppose that through some quirk a clearly guilty murderer has technically not violated any contractual provisions. Or, suppose an arbiter who would only be hearing murder cases because of past excellence in his rulings, for some reason makes an outrageous ruling, and finds someone innocent of murder despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Because he was technically acquitted, the murderer would not have to pay damages to the estate of his victim. However, the rules governing this episode would be quickly revised to prevent its recurrence. Private companies would be under much greater pressure than monopoly governments in the face of such bad publicity. There is another difference. Under a government system, someone acquitted on a technicality gets off scot-free. But under the private law system I've described, the killer's insurance company could still increase the payments they charge. It wouldn't matter whether their clients had been actually convicted of a crime, their only concern would be the likelihood that he would be convicted of a different crime in the future, because then they'd have to pay the damages. This analysis also resolves the issue of parole. Although most crimes would involve financial restitution rather than imprisonment, there would still be individuals who were too dangerous to be allowed loose. The insurance companies would determine this threshold. As long as a company were willing to pay for any damages a criminal might co commit in the future, people would offer him work, let him rent a room, etc., Rehabilitation would thus be in the great financial interest of the companies in order to increase their pool of paying customers. On the other hand, truly dangerous individuals would not be paroled. Right now the government has psychologists and other experts decide when sex offenders and murderers should be let back on the streets. Since they have no accountability, these ivory tower intellectuals often test out their theories on the hapless victims of recidivist criminals. 6. Conclusion This essay has outlined the mechanics of purely voluntary market law. The main theme running throughout is that competition and accountability would force true experts to handle the important decisions that must be made in any legal system. It is a statist myth that justice must be produced by a monopoly institution of organized violence. The arguments of this essay are admittedly incomplete. Surely more thought is needed before a move to market anarchy becomes feasible. However, I ask that the reader resist the temptation to dismiss my ideas as unworkable without first specifying in what sense the government legal system works 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 dish and reckless to entrust the state with the protection of civilian lives and property private defense forces would enjoy a tremendous advantage and in all but the most lopsided contests would slaughter their government adversaries one Insurance In an anarchist society committed to the sanctity of private property and contract, insurance companies would most likely oversee defence services. To see how this market would operate, an analogy would be useful. Imagine a large city located on a major fault line. Every so often the residents endure a severe earthquake, which kills dozens of people and causes billions of dollars in property damage. To cope with the risk of such disasters, people purchase insurance for their lives and property. 
Policyholders pay a fixed premium, while the insurance agencies pledge to indemnify the estates of anyone who suffers bodily or financial harm during an earthquake, according to the precise terms specified in the contract. The force of competition keeps the price of such insurance reasonable. Actuaries can estimate the expected costs per period of providing certain levels of coverage and thus calculate the minimum premiums that would allow in the insurer, all things considered, to break even in the long run. If the market rates exceeded these minimum prices, new firms will have an incentive to enter the insurance market to reap the profits. Their entry would drive insurance premiums down towards the actuarially fair rates. It is crucial to realize that the behavior of the residents greatly influences the city's vulnerability to earthquakes, and thus the total bill paid out by insurance companies following each disaster. Buildings, roads and bridges can be designed with varying degrees of structural integrity and construction costs. The better the design, the greater its expense. Through their premium structure, insurance companies provide incentives for safer designs, thus defraying their higher costs. Profit-hungry businesses will thereby produce buildings and infrastructure exhibiting the optimal combination of durability and price without any need for government codes and inspectors. In addition to encouraging sturdier designs, insurance companies could use other means to reduce their exposure. They might employ teams of seismologists to forecast earthquakes and publicize these findings as a service to their customers. For those citizens too, for, too poor to avoid housing in quake-proof buildings, the insurance companies can construct shelters and require that these policyholders evacuate their buildings and retire to the shelters in an emergency. In general, an insurance company will gladly spend funds to protect its clients and their property, so long as the expected reduction in liability claims is sufficient to justify the expenditure. Just as the free market can provide the optimal response to dangerous earthquakes, so too can it provide the best protection from foreign militaries. Like natural disasters, wars bring widespread death and destruction. In market anarchy, insurance companies would provide coverage for these losses too, and would thus have a great financial interest in deterring and repelling military attacks. 2. Financing it is easy enough to imagine a system of private mail delivery or even highway construction. In contrast, free market defense presents a conceptual hurdle, since it is not clear what would be the voluntary analogues to government taxation and military spending. Defense from foreign aggression is a classic public good, and as such seems the perfect candidate for government provision. Without the ability to extort revenues from all citizens, how could private firms raise the funds required by modern militaries? After all, any individual citizen could refuse to buy the product, yet still enjoy the security made possible by his neighbor's contributions. On a practical level, hundreds of small decentralized armies would surely be wiped out by a consolidated attack from a neighboring state. The framework described in the first section avoids these apparent difficulties. In a free society, it is not the average person, but rather the insurance companies that would purchase defense services. Every dollar in damage caused by foreign aggression would be fully compensated, and thus insurers would seek to protect their customers' property as if it were their own. Because of economies of scale, coverage for large geographical regions would likely be handled through a few dominant firms, ensuring standardized pricing and a coordinated defense. It will be useful to elaborate on this hypothetical consolidation. Suppose we start in an initial anarchist society with no defense services at all. Imagine that the one serious military threat is invasion and conquest by a certain mercurial neighbor. The residents of this free society take out insurance policies on their lives and all major property, such that the total claims that would follow an invasion are estimated at $1 trillion. The insurance agencies hire geopolitical consultants and believe that the annual risk of attack is 10%. 
they must therefore collect roughly a hundred billion dollars a year in premiums to cover themselves. If the society is composed of ten million people, the per capita expenditure on insurance from foreign aggression is ten thousand dollars. On top of this hefty expense, the residents remain completely vulnerable. In this bleak situation, an executive at the Ace Insurance Company has a brilliant idea. He can undercut his rivals and offer the same level of coverage for only, say, $5,000 per person, half the price charged by his competitors. He can afford to do this by spending some of his revenues on military defences and thereby lower the probability of foreign conquest. For example, he might pay private defence agencies $40 billion a year to maintain helicopters, tanks, trained personnel, etc., and be on constant alert to repel any attacks. If these preparations reduced the chance of foreign invasion to only, say, one-half of one percent per year, then they would pay for themselves. The innovative insurance executive would reap huge profits and capture the market for military liability, while the residents would enjoy increased security and lower premiums. With property safe from foreign expropriation, investment and population growth would be stimulated, allowing greater economies of scale and further rate cuts. Free Riders Does the above system really avoid the perennial problem of private defence? That is, can it overcome the free rider problem? After Ace Insurance entered into long-term contracts with defence agencies, what would stop a rival firm, such as Moocher Insurance, from undercutting Ace? After all, the likelihood of property damage would be the same for Moocher's clients as for Ace's, yet Moocher wouldn't spend a dime on military expenditures. This reasoning is perfectly valid, yet the case for private defence remains strong. In the first place, the clients of the insurance companies are not homogenous, and consequently the market for defence is far more lumpy than assumed in standard economic models. Although above we discussed per capita premiums, this was only to give the reader a rough idea of the expenses involved. In reality, large firms would provide the bulk of revenue for the insurance industry, the policies taken out on apartment complexes, shopping malls, manufacturing plants, banks and skyscrapers would dwarf those taken out by individuals. Consequently, there wouldn't be the nightmarish bargaining problem that so worries the sceptics of private defence. The brilliant executive at Ace Insurance would be perfectly aware of the above considerations. If necessary, he would write only long-term contracts and would make them conditional on the acceptance of a minimum threshold of clients. In other words, he would offer a package deal to the major companies, but the special low rates would only apply if a sufficient number of those policies were sold. It is true that this suggested remedy is rather vague. There are many interesting issues studied in cooperative game theory, concerning the bargaining process of these large firms and how the costs of defence would be split among them. But make no mistake, military defence would be adequately funded for the simple reason that shareholders of rich companies are anything but reckless when it comes to money. Because of their size, the biggest companies couldn't ignore the effect of their own behaviour on military preparedness. Furthermore, certain types of property, airports, bridges, highways, power plants, and, of course, military equipment, would be far likelier targets of foreign attack, and their owners would thus constitute an even smaller group to benefit disproportionately from defence expenditures. This heterogeneity would weaken further the spillover character of defence services, making an efficient arrangement all the easier to achieve. Those companies that ended up paying the most might perceive the arrangement as unfair, but there would nevertheless always be an arrangement. The highest contributors might even advertise this fact, much as large corporations make ostentatious donations to charity in order to carry goodwill. Thus we see that the lumpiness of a realistic defence industry mitigates the impact of the positive externalities, spillover effects, of military spending. 
Because a few critical industries will pay for a basic level of defence regardless of contributions from others, the only possible harm of free riding would be an unfair burden placed on certain corporations. In any event, it isn't obvious that there would even be widespread free riding. As we shall now argue, defence services can largely be restricted to paying customers after all. In the earlier discussion, we treated a foreign invasion as an all-or-nothing proposition. The neighbouring state either quickly conquered the anarchist society or was effectively deterred from attacking. In reality, wars can remain in stalemate for many years. During such protracted struggles, insurance companies would certainly be able to deploy their military forces so as to limit gratuitous protection for non-clients. Most obvious, naval escorts would only protect convoys of paying customers. All other shipping would be at the mercy of foreign fleets. Anti-aircraft and missile defences would only protect those regions in which paying customers owned property. And, of course, the owners of real estate on the border would always pay for its protection, lest the defence agencies pull their tanks and troops back to a more defensible position. Government versus private military expenditures The above considerations show that people living in market anarchy could overcome the free rider problem and raise funds adequate for their defence. Yet there is a symmetric counter-argument that is generally overlooked. It is true that coercive taxation allows governments to acquire immense military budgets, but this advantage is more than offset by the tendency of governments to squander their resources. For any meaningful comparison between government and private defence budgets, the latter needs to be multiplied several fold, since private agencies can purchase equivalent military hardware at only a fraction of the prices paid by governments. Everyone knows that governments are profligate with their money, and that military budgets are always a huge component of total spending. Since their operations are often conducted in foreign lands and shrouded in secrecy, a military can spend its funding with virtually no accountability. Taxpayers were shocked when an audit revealed that the US Pentagon had spent $600 per toilet seat. What few people realise is that this example is typical. Because of the government's monopoly, no one has any idea how much an F-14 Tomcat should cost, and so its $38 million price tag shocks no one. This last point is important, so I want to stress that it is caused by the very nature of government, not merely the accidents of history. If a government raises its funds through taxation, then it must justify this theft by spending the money on the public good. Except in the most despotic regimes, the rulers can't simply pocket the money. Consequently, not a single official in the entire government has any personal incentive to identify and eliminate wasteful spending. In market anarchy, on the other hand, defence services would be sold in the open market. Fierce competition among suppliers and cost consciousness among the buyers would keep the prices of toilet seats as well as fighter jets as low as possible. 3. Economic Calculation The first two sections demonstrated that military defence, like any other service, can be provided on the free market. To appreciate the tremendous advantage that this gives to the anarchist society, it will be useful to first explore the peacetime superiority of private industry versus government planning. To this end, we will review the critique of socialism. The traditional opponents of socialism argued that it has insufficient incentives for the average worker. Without tying pay to performance, people would shirk and output would be far lower than in a capitalist economy. Only if a new socialist man evolved, who enjoyed working for his comrades as much as for himself, could a socialist system succeed. Although valid, this criticism misses the essence of the problem. It took Ludwig von Mises to explain in a 1920s paper the true flaw with socialism. 
Without market prices for the means of production, government planners cannot engage in economic calculation and so literally have no idea if they are using society's resources efficiently. Consequently, socialism suffers not only from a problem of incentives, but also from a problem of knowledge. To match the performance of a market economy, socialist planners would not need to be merely angels committed to the commonweal, they would also need to be gods capable of superhuman calculations. At any time, there is only a limited supply of labour, raw materials and capital resources that can be combined in various ways to create output goods. A primary function of an economic system is to determine which goods should be produced, in what quantities and in what manner from those limited resources. The market economy solves this problem through the institution of private property, which implies free enterprise and freely floating prices. The owners of capital, labour and natural resources, the means of production, are free to sell their property to the highest bidder. The entrepreneurs are free to produce and sell whatever goods they wish. The ultimate test of profit and loss imposes order on this seeming chaos. If a producer consistently spends more on his inputs than he earns from selling his output, he will go bankrupt and no longer have any influence on the manner in which society's resources are used. On the other hand, the successful producer creates value for customers by purchasing resources at a certain price and transforming them into goods that fetch a higher price. In the market economy, such behaviour is rewarded with profits, which allow the producer in question to have a greater say in the use of society's scarce resources. None of this is true in the socialist state. Even if they truly intended the happiness of their subjects, the government planners would squander the resources at their disposal. With no test of profit and loss, the planners would have no feedback and would thus be operating in the dark. A decision to produce more shoes and fewer shirts or vice versa would be largely arbitrary. Furthermore, the individuals to ultimately decide the fate of society's resources would be selected through the political process, not through the meritocracy of the market. 4. Private versus Government Defence the general advantages of private industry over government planning operate just as well in the field of military defence. Because the military derives its funding in a coercive manner, the link between output and consumer satisfaction is severed. Because of their monopoly, a state's armed forces can bumble along indefinitely with no benchmark of comparison. Even in a limited state whose subjects enjoy a large degree of economic freedom, the armed forces constitute an island of socialism. To get a sense of the problems involved, imagine the situation faced by Joseph Stalin during World War II. As absolute dictator, Stalin had at his disposal every resource, including human, in the Soviet Union. Stalin needed to use these resources to achieve his goals, the foremost of which, we shall assume, was the preservation and expansion of his political rule. Some of Stalin's choices were obvious enough. Clearly he needed to overthrow the Nazi regime, and clearly this required, before their surrender, defeat of the German armies besieging Stalingrad. As we become more specific, however, Stalin's choices become less clear. Yes, he should use all available steel for the production of military equipment. There is no need for new tractors at the moment. But how much of this steel should be devoted to planes, to tanks and to which models, to mortars, to bombs or to railroads needed to move material to the front? Yes, all civilians, young and old, sick and healthy, should devote their lives to repelling the Huns. But precisely how many people should engage the enemy, work in tank factories, dig trenches around the city, or forage for food to ensure survival through the winter. Even those tactical and strategic decisions normally made by military commanders have the same flavour. Yes, a sharpshooter such as Vasily Zaitsev should be used as a sniper, rather than as a bomber pilot or factory worker. But how best to exploit Vasily? Should he be ordered to kill as many Germans as quickly as possible? 
Surely not, for with every shot he reveals his position. But would it also be far too conservative to have him wait months in the hope of getting one clear shot at a general? It is evident that Stalin, or his subordinates, must make all of these decisions and thousands more just like them, largely through arbitrary guesswork. The wartime goal of expelling the enemy is no different from the peacetime problem of food production. In both cases, Stalin's actions led to the deaths of millions of people. Just as a free market in agriculture would have prevented famine, a free market in defence would have prevented such monstrous casualties. Private defence. Economic calculation allows entrepreneurs to judge whether a plan has been profitable. It allows successful ventures to expand and causes failed operations to disband. The market constantly readjusts itself to the changing data, conditions of supply, consumer demand, technical knowledge. Now that we understand the manner in which insurance companies could objectively and quantitatively appraise military success, it is easy to see the advantages of private defence. In a situation comparable to the Battle of Stalingrad, the anarchist community would respond in the most efficient manner humanly possible. Insurance companies would determine the relative value of various military targets and place bounties on them for capture or elimination. Individuals left to their own spontaneous devices would try various techniques to produce this service. Some might buy tanks and hire men to attack the Germans head-on. Others might hire sharpshooters to snipe at them from afar. Some might buy mortars and shell them. Some might hire propagandists and offer bribes to lure defectors. Over time, only the best defence firms would survive. They would expand their operations, increasing the overall efficiency of the war effort. Because they would be operating in a system of property rights, they would need to purchase all of their resources, including labour. This would ensure that the resources were being used as effectively as possible. For example, those areas on the front in urgent need of soldiers or ammunition would bid up their wages or prices, avoiding the arbitrariness of government troop deployment and supply. Even if, to reduce transaction costs and maximise response time, a single firm monopolised the defence of a region, the firm could still engage in internal cost accounting and calculate the profitability of its various branches. Perhaps more important, free competition would ensure that technological and strategic advances were rewarded and quickly implemented. In contrast, a government military must rely on a bureaucratic chain of command where innovation, especially from outsiders, is stifled. In a very real sense, a military confrontation between a statist and a free society would be a war of a few minds versus millions. Apples and Oranges This theoretical discussion is sure to provoke the cynic to remark, I'd like to see what your insurance companies would do if they met a panzer division. But such a question misses the point. We have demonstrated that a private defence system is the most effective, not that it is invulnerable. Yes, a small society of anarchists would be unable to repel the total might of Nazi Germany. But a small society of statists would fare even worse, and in fact, plenty of government militaries were obliterated by Hitler's armies expertise. One might wonder whether private individuals would be as knowledgeable about military affairs as government professionals. Surely Colin Powell makes a better general than Bill Gates. This fact rests on the monopoly status of the U.S. military. If private individuals were allowed to compete with Pentagon generals, the incompetence of the latter would be manifest. The average stockholder is no expert in professional sports or foreign cuisine, yet private ownership still yields excellent baseball clubs and French restaurants. Savvy executives hire others to identify talented individuals. Intelligence Even if a military bound by property rights and contract would have fared well in wars of an earlier era, what of modern warfare with its sophisticated espionage? Could there be anarchist spies? Private defence agencies would gather research just as any company does, 
They would hire analysts and collect information in any way legally possible. Presumably, the most powerful computers and smartest codebreakers would reside in an anarchist society. Whatever, if any, the loss caused by prohibitions on wiretaps and torture, it would be more than recovered in efficiency. On this topic, we note that counterintelligence would probably be quite limited. Defence agencies would have, possibly, several major buyers and would, pro would be operating in an open market. Consequently, they would need to advertise the capabilities of their products. This openness, however, is a virtue. What better way to avoid military defeat than by showing potential enemies how advanced their anarchist foe would be? The defence agencies in a free society would have nothing to hide from governments. Do or die. The nature of military defence makes it less amenable to the trial and error correction mechanism of the free market. A nation can spend years in preparation for an attack without receiving any feedback on the quality of its efforts. A sudden invasion could then wipe out the private defenders before they had a chance to adapt. This situation is different from the typical industry in which repeated transactions day in, day out allow experimentation with various techniques and the weeding out of inefficiencies. To meet this objection, we must remember that private defence agencies, unlike their government counterparts, need not be limited to regional clients. A multinational defence agency could provide, say, fighter jet services to several insurance companies in various areas of the world. Although inadequate, strategies or training might remain hidden until a sudden disaster, at most only one of the agency's franchises would be lost. The others would study the incident and learn to avoid it. In such an environment, military strategists from all over the world co would collaborate in the new art of defence. While government planners guarded their precious secrets and protocols, anarchist agencies would hire the best and brightest minds. Expert personnel would be rotated from region to region, providing training in the latest tactics and equipment. High-tech weapons would be stockpiled in central locations and loaned out to anarchist societies under imminent threat of attack. This sharing, unthinkable among government militaries except in the direst circumstances, would further reduce the costs of private defence. Nuclear weapons The case for private defence must deal with the possibility of nuclear blackmail. In modern warfare, it would seem that only a nation that can credibly threaten to obliterate its opponents is safe from a first strike. The anarchist society would probably not develop or even own nuclear weapons. In the first place, the term defence has been adopted consciously in this essay and is not the euphemism as used in government propaganda. Because they would gain nothing from foreign conquest, since this would constitute theft and would be fully prosecuted within the anarchist courts, the owners of defence agencies would have no reason to spend money on weapons that were ill-suited to tactical defence. Precision of weaponry would be of paramount importance since battles would be fought near or amidst a defence agency's customers. Another, perhaps more significant consideration, is that defence agencies would be most likely legally prohibited from owning weapons of mass destruction. The anarchist legal system would operate on the same principles of voluntary contract that underlay the defence industry. Insurance companies would vouch for individuals and pledge to compensate anyone victimised by their clients. In an effort to limit their liability, insurers would require certain concessions from their customers. It is hard to imagine that an insurance agency would pledge, say, $1 million for any innocent person killed by defence firm X when firm X held a stockpile of hydrogen bombs. Despite its probable lack of nuclear weapons, the anarchist society remains a viable option. Most obvious, there are statist societies that currently survive without nuclear devices. By its very nature, the anarchist society would be a completely harmless neighbour. 
No state would ever fear attack from an anarchist military, and so there would be no need to preemptively strike it, unlike the Japanese on Pearl Harbor. With no taxation, regulation, tariffs or immigration quotas, the anarchist society would be of tremendous value to all major governments. They would surely act to protect it from intimidation by a rival nuclear power. 5. Lessons from History The historical record supports our theoretical discussion. Government military campaigns are characterized by gross blunders that would be comical if not so tragic. The only reason certain powers, such as the United States, maintain their aura of dominance is that they only fight other governments. So far we have restricted attention to government militaries per se. In reality, of course, a state hampers all of its operations with wartime controls, further weakening its military effectiveness. Price controls cause not only consumer vexation through ration cards and meatless Tuesdays, but also reduce output. Modern wars are won with material. It is no accident that the freest nations usually win their wars. It is a statist myth that abuse of rights must be met in kind. Bertrand de Juvenal, in his classic On Power, argues that the other European countries had no choice but to institute conscription in response to Napoleon. Yet this example only proves the dismal imagination of government planners. Surely a resilient anarchist society would have used its superior technology and industrial capacity to furnish voluntary armies with forts, cannons, horses and protective armour sufficient to repel more numerous yet ill-equipped and poorly trained conscripts. The analogy of France fighting other European powers is inappropriate. If a government army ever attacked an anarchist society, the situation would be akin to the Vietnam War with the technological roles reversed. There would be a clash of cultures similar to the encounter between Pizarro and the Incan emperor Atahualpa. The advantages of private property are as manifest in the production of defence services as with any other. There is nothing magical about government military forces, if they have fewer tanks and planes and an inferior organization, they will lose to their anarchist opponents. A tiny country such as Taiwan can outperform communist China in the economic arena. It could defend itself just as efficiently if its residents would only abandon their faith in government, police and armies and embrace total freedom. Race, total freedom. Race, total freedom. Race, total freedom. Race, total freedom.